Hello, this is Gary Auden, and I'm bringing you an Educast, Artificial Intelligence in Enterprise Communications. We've all heard about AI, but let's talk about some practical applications of it rather than some of these far-reaching, off-in-the-future applications. As we always do, we talk about our speakers today. Today is Phil Marischal. He's VP Product Management, Business Development at Yamaha UC. You may have known of this as Revo Labs before they change their name. As we always do, we talk about what we're gonna talk about. Phil is gonna take us through the history of artificial intelligence, what it is, what it means in the enterprise. Gonna talk about the market growth, concerns about AI, how AI can work with collaboration, and then we're gonna get into some predictions. Phil, when did artificial intelligence actually begin? Hi, artificial intelligence really began in 1955 as a term that was coined by John McCarthy, who was a professor studying computer science. Um, as artificial intelligence, he was trying to envision what computers could possibly do in a future. He was a developer of many unique programming languages, including Lisp, and also thought of the ideas of eventually computers having enough capability to have interactive conversations with people. From there, artificial intelligence flourished as an academic research area, and as machines continue to improve their processing capability, algorithms were also being developed. There seem to be many interpretations of AI. Would you define artificial intelligence for us? Yeah, I would be happy to define artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is a very broadly used term, we believe that specifically, Artificial intelligence now should be defined as a machine that can continue to learn and improve its algorithm without humans explicitly telling it what to do. We'll explain why this is different than earlier versions of artificial intelligence and how new innovations in this area are now being driven by new programming techniques, algorithms, and languages that allow computers to become self-teaching and self-learning. Oh. Artificial intelligence, you said, started about 1980. What was the first 10 years like? Well, the first 10 years was really trying to exploit the ability for computers to do faster and faster uh, computational analysis on large data sets. Complex problems require a lot of inputs, and the computers have to do a lot of careful calculation. And so when computers with highly optimized programs can do certain things people were calling that artificial intelligence. But in fact, it was a computer program that was driven very hard by large computers to achieve a very specific result. So the area was really trying to define algorithms, improve the ability for computers to take many different kinds of inputs, and then create a very specific output. From what you're saying is, the, we were computer bound at the time, but as computers got faster, we could do more. Then what happened for the next 20 years? So the next 20 years, people began to create very complicated, highly structured computer programs that were very sophisticated, sophisticated for a single task. For example, teaching a computer how to play chess means that the computer has to make billions of calculations on all the different outcomes that a chess move may have on a chessboard. However, because computers are so powerful, they can calculate all of those very quickly and then come out with the best move on the chessboard for the next chess piece. This is different than self-teaching and self-learning systems. So all these computer programs like the chess program and IBM Watson are really very large data sets with very optimized computer programs looking for the best specific answer. And therefore they achieve to be intelligent, but they're actually just extremely smart programs capable of doing one single thing. As you said, this was just one single thing, but now we're moving into more the present. A lot has happened since 2010. Would you cover that? Sure. Now, with the ability to begin to program neural networks, the computer science industry came to a startling conclusion that until now, computers had to calculate a single result. And no matter how sophisticated the problem, the computer could only produce one answer. Now with new computer programming techniques, it actually can compute 
thousands of probabilities and then assign weights to them. So think about it. Alexa can't listen precisely to everything you say, but it can listen to 90% of what you say and make an outcome. So now programs have a weighted answer, i.e. I'm 90% confident that this is the answer that I should give the user, and therefore I'm willing to produce an output knowing that I might be wrong 5% of the time or 10% of the time because of the ability to process the input. I can't understand the language, I can't understand the accent, and it still makes it useful information. So now computer programming with neural networks means that you're looking for a highly calculated output and probable answer. And all the new programming techniques are willing to accept a little bit of loss of accuracy for highly efficient capabilities for being able to transcribe languages, study complex programs, be able to look at extremely large data sets and try to find an answer for you and learn as it goes. That's all sort of nice and beneficial, but we're really concerned about where does AI actually enter the enterprise? So AI is already in the enterprise today. For example, if you were to go onto Google and search for an image, artificial intelligence looks at thousands of images being uploaded every day, tries to calculate an algorithm that comes to the po closest possible picture that you want and then sends you an output. If you use Facebook in your business enterprise, Facebook uses artificial intelligence programming languages and capabilities, trying to look for outcomes as well, trying to find matches, trying to do the social structures that they like to create between users. So AI is in your enterprise today, and that's where you already are experiencing the benefits of AI in Salesforce, Facebook, Google, as products that you're using in your workday life. It sounds to me like AI is really just beginning to grow. What does the growth look like with the, for the market for AI? Analysts are telling us that the market through 2020 should grow at over 50%, and that AI has a tremendous potential, because now we've accepted the fact that AI systems may not be perfect, but as long as they're highly accurate and the algorithms continue to self-teach and self-learn, the value to the enterprise overall will mean thousands of different AI applications that'll begin to go into your sales, into your marketing, into all the various aspects of running a business, providing meaningful output from enormous amounts of information that would be very hard for a human being to look at all of them. For example, studying all your sales figures for the last year and finding statistical nuances you may have missed, or being able to create social media campaigns connecting to users you wouldn't have thought of because they might have intersecting correlations to other things that they're looking for your products or services and you didn't even know it. It seems that AI is going to appear in a lot of places we haven't even seen yet, but yet you seem to have some concerns about AI. Yes, now, thank you for pointing that out. Our concerns about AI revolve around, for example, we use phones here. You know, the phone used to be fairly simple in January 1999, but today a phone has enormous capability, is instantly connected to the cloud, can give you instant access to many different AI applications, and in business contact, we have to be concerned about privacy of business information and privacy of data. Because these devices are being bought into business enterprises uh, by millions and millions of users, IT departments have to understand that proprietary confidential information, whether it's HR, legal, or even business operations and plans that you're making for in the future, are all being fed into devices that are instantly cloud connected. So companies should have very strict policies for the use of information over consumer devices so they can ensure that the data that's fundamental to the competitiveness of the company, the legal requirements of the company is contained. And right now, this technology is happening faster than IT departments can really understand or grasp the potential impacts of. But let's bring this down to something we can actually put our hands around, and that's collaboration and AI. So we do think there's some usefulness in AI for collaboration. A simple example is meeting automation. You could have an AI assistant listen to your voice, start the meeting, mute the microphones without you having to touch a button, can reprogram the next meeting, calendaring events just by asking the computer, can we have the same meeting next Tuesday with all the same participants? 
They can also look at large data and analytics. Look at your sales figures, trying to find information or missing statistical analysis very simply. Um, being able to take notes and transcribe meetings. AI assistants are getting very good at being able to listen to everything that's being said. And as it begins to be able to identify speakers and their voices by voice imprint, it can actually create very useful meeting notes for companies and uh, can provide that kind of helpful assistant in your meetings that you're having today. I know we all read some reports and Gartner is one of those that comes up with predictions. Would you review some of those for us? So there's a lot of um, information and ideas and predictions about the AI industry and some of them are far-fetched and some of them are kind of realistic. Um, but idea that AI can do simple tasks, that customer service programming, program interfaces can replace human interfaces, for example, in a travel agent. Often the conversation with a travel agent for an airplane is really a pretty well scripted and understood uh, relationship between a person and another person. Technologies and AI could make that highly automated. So that unless you're asking for it a very obscure kind of thing for your airline flights, it could be in 90% of the time done with a human voice assistant. And so startups are trying to take advantage of using artificial intelligence to create voice image, voice language into text, creating platforms that will allow simple things like bank telling, customer service, airline tickets, into automated robots. And these robots will be able to efficiently serve billions of people at scale through cloud applications. When I listen to you, you're talking about AI in sort of narrow applications, which in my mind says some industry experts are still saying the jury is out for AI. What's your opinion? Well, I think AI sometimes becomes the legend of science fiction where, you know, the robots are going to take over, that somehow computers will become so smart that we'll all just become robots to the robots, and that very smart computers can solve all our problems. But I think that that's kind of uh, a little bit far-fetched. You know, we live in very, very complicated information structures. You know, robots do not have the ability to take in five senses like we do as humans. And until the point that the robots can create uh, an understanding of all the ways that we, cr we understand and process information, including consciousness, including philosophies, including our ability to have our five senses basically digitized, I think that we still need to have the human expert in front of the AI algorithm. Well, let's move into how you apply AI, and would you introduce the CS700 for us? So the CS700 is our latest product at Yamaha. It's a sound bar that has a video camera built in. It's designed with extremely high quality video cameras and also a microphone array that basically beams around the room looking for the active speaker and then does a number of audio processing technologies so that the active speaker is picked up and that background noise is removed, including fan noise and other noises, allows you to very simply hook up your computer with one single USB cable and create a powerful video conferencing experience for a room of people in a matter of seconds. Now let's talk a little further. How does AI and the Yamaha CS700 actually work together? Great question. So our engineers at Yamaha used AI as part of the audio processing in the CS700. The system has a neural network capability, which means that you can teach the sound processing of the CS700 to detect certain uh, sound files. Let's say, for example, you decided that you wanted to eliminate the sound of potato chips from ever interfering with a conversation you could feed the CS700 sound files of various kinds of potato chip crunching sounds, and it would learn that crunching sound, and then from then on, it would remove the crunching sound from the audio stream in the conversation, and nobody would ever hear you munching on a potato chip again in a conference. It's a simple example that shows, but it shows how neural networks can be trained by feeding different voice sample files, sounds like background sounds, or typing sounds, or potato chip sounds, and remove them from the conversation so that you can have a clear, accurate, and highly successful meeting. 
that makes me laugh a little bit because I'm thinking of, couldn't we someday actually block out people we don't want to hear? Probably, but right now we're all about making sure that humans can be heard and we're trying to uh, ignore the potato chip person. Now, Yamaha Unified Communications used to be called Revo Labs. Would you inform us more about the name change? So a couple of years ago, almost about four now, Yamaha went and acquired Revo Labs, a company out of Boston, Massachusetts, who was making uh, these kinds of technologies. Uh, Yamaha has unbelievable audio technologies in Japan, but they're trying to seek new markets outside of Japan for the various audio technologies they want to build. They have a, a consumer audio division that makes receivers and soundbars. They have a pro audio division that makes audio mixers, soundboards, speakers for pro audio requirements, as well as DSPs. And now they have Revo Labs, which is part of Yamaha, which is making products for the enterprise. The combined unification of all these different kinds of audio technologies from Yamaha means that you're gonna see a lot of really fantastic audio products and video products coming out of this new division of Yamaha uh, in the next couple of years. We've talked about AI, would you help us sort of I'll summarize the points about AI before we finish. I'd be happy to summarize the points of AI. AI will improve the collaboration experience. It'll make it easier to have conferences where you don't have to push a button, where you can talk to a system, and where you can have your meeting notes recorded, transcribed, and delivered to everybody on email. We also think that there's a big play in, art in virtual reality as part of the conference room experience being able to insert into the video stream three-dimensional objects and uh, be able to look at products, be able to look at spreadsheets, being able to look at dynamic real-time data as you're analyzing your business models. Um, companies that are able to harness the power of machine learning data where they can look at very large amounts of sales information going back for the last three years and enabling AI systems to look for perhaps things that you may have missed and studying that information, but also helping create a more natural interaction between people over time and distance will create a better experience. We, we think that virtual reality should be thought of as kind of the smart assistant in the room, but we also still need to have human beings make sure they preserve their information if it's confidential, make sure that they understand that AI is not perfect calculation of an answer, but an algorithm that gives you a fairly high calculation of an algorithm and uh, use it as part of your strategy for your long-term IP and collaboration needs. If I summarize your summary, we're basically starting at the beginning of imagination of where AI can work. So yes. what I want to point out, there's some resources here, the insights about Yamaha UC and AI and the products, contact information, because I think you should pursue the conversation. And thank you very much, Phil, and I appreciate the time you spent in enlightening us. My pleasure. I'd like to uh, answer any questions. Anybody, please reach out to me.